How's it going, everybody? We will get started in just a moment. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. It is a little different than what we've normally been doing. Um, as you can see, I am not in the home studio, just like we uh, talked about in the description and the title and all that fun stuff if you're joining us from one of the places you've seen the ads. Uh, for today's stream, there's a couple kind of cool things that I want to go over and just kind of have a conversation with everybody about and, uh, you know, show you guys some cool stuff that I do with my S1R, which is kind of a unique S1R in the overall category of what we've got because I've made some modifications to it. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to use the opportunity to just broadcast from somewhere different as a... Uh, I can see uh, someone's commenting, you know, about the weather. We've got gorgeous weather here in Austin, Texas, and uh, why not take advantage of it and utilize some of our cool technologies that we've got? So uh, if you are new to these Lumix live streams, uh, welcome. These are weekly broadcasts that we do. We rarely do them out like this, um, but uh, as I said before, with the awesome weather, why not? Uh, but ultimately, these are streams that we do to talk to everybody and just kind of have a community, build conversations, build, uh, you know, kind of relationships with everybody so that we can share ideas and you guys can all get your questions asked uh, and answered from the brand. So you're not having to go through a forum and someone's guess of an answer. You're able to ask them directly to us uh, and myself. Uh, it, again, if you are new, my name's Sean. Uh, I am one of the marketing team and I'm the host of Lumix Live. I've been doing this for about a year and well, almost two years at this point. So um, basically the way these streams work uh, for this particular one is if you have questions for us, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras in the chat so that it pops up on my screen here. I'm doing it a little bit different, using my phone to monitor the chat and get all the questions answered for you guys. Uh, and we're open to having basically whatever questions you guys want to have asked uh, answered. But uh, as you can see here, we're using the GH5 Mark II. I've got it linked up wirelessly to my uh, Galaxy Z Flip 3 using the 5G network so that I can be broadcasting right here out to all of you. Uh, it's kind of one of the cooler things that we've released with a lot of these cameras. Um, up until recently, as a lot of you have seen, you know, with our streams, we're doing them from a studio, which means I'm hardwired into a switcher or I'm hardwired into a capture device using HDMI out. And that's still a great way to do broadcasting, but you're stuck within the, um, the kind of category that you see everybody else doing. It's broadcasting from one location. You know, there's no, there's no kind of differentiation between your stream and somebody else's stream. So. I'm curious, since I don't have the setup to do a poll like we've been doing for the recent streams, curious if you guys shout out in the chat if you think that live broadcasting like this would be something that you could see adding into your uh, you know, kind of business, your, your output to a client, or even if it's just something that you would be doing for yourself, for family, friends, things like that. You know, we have a, uh, uh, yeah, so, Terrell, yeah, so I am in a public location, so there are going to be some people comment, uh, you know, talking in the background, which is cool. Um, I can try to adjust my mics a little bit. I don't have any of the noise reduction software stuff that I've had in the past, so it's a little different. Uh, but, yeah, as I was saying, I'd love to see in the chat if this is something that you guys think you'd actually utilize for your own types of business. Um, 
so outside of this, let's uh, let's kind of talk about some of the cool stuff that I wanted to talk about on my own for this kind of topic. So one of the uh, the things that we talked about in the uh, description of this was about how you know I'm using my S1R to demonstrate some cool features and tech that we have in our cameras. And one of the things that actually really kind of spurred me to wanting to do this kind of stuff is that my S1R is a converted S1R. So this is not a stock uh, S1R that you would normally be able to buy off the shelf. This is a, a customized version of it. And I've talked about it before in different streams. Uh, so what this one is, this is a fully um, full spectrum conversion S1R. So that means that I can be doing visual spectrum, I can be doing infrared spectrum, I can do uh, uh, ultraviolet photography and videography if I wanted to. And all you have to do is just drop different filters onto the uh, camera itself. So like I have one here that's called an IR chrome filter, which is designed to match the old, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it, but an older style of infrared style photography. Then I have an 850 millimeter or 850 nanometer infrared filter on this one right here, so I can do black and white infrared. And the cool thing with this is that if you're doing something like this on your own camera, it can open up a lot of really cool things for you, uh, different styles of shooting. But all you have to do with this is just put a hot filter onto the front of the lens, and then now you're back to shooting visible spectrum. So why do I bring this up? Why, does, why is this something that is kind of interesting with our cameras in particular? Well. Back in the day when you wanted to do this kind of photography, you either had to be using a DSLR, which meant that you're not actually seeing what the end result is. If you wanted to shoot black and white infrared photography, you're looking at a near black screen. You can't really see any information from it. Um, with mirrorless technology and mirrorless cameras, the camera is able to actually still display that information for you. So you're able to actually see what the image is gonna look like, expose it pretty much just like you'd expose a regular image. You're not having to guess what the exposure is. You're not having to worry about focus calibrations, things like that, because everything's done in the camera and focus is done off the sensor. So it makes this kind of experimentation with your photography and videography that much better and that much easier, uh, where, like I said, it was a nightmare to do this before, especially if you go back to talking about, you know, shooting infrared on film. Um, so when we start, you know, kind of looking at what tools do you have in the camera that kind of helps these things, right? We've talked about them in previous streams. Uh, we did the video tools stream a couple of weeks back, which on the playback of this, we'll put a uh, card up there so you guys can see that. But you have different uh, capabilities like setting your white balance in the camera on the fly. So you're not having to necessarily make sure that your white balance is set, you know, uh, in post, you're not shooting on a white balance, which is not really the best way I'd say people should be shooting anymore these days. If you're going to be, you know, photographing and using video, you want to try to nail your exposure, nail your white balance in camera as best you can, even if you're shooting in RAW. So, like I mentioned, we have the one touch white balance uh, functionality in the camera, and that's just by going, clicking on the white balance button on the top of the camera. That opens up a little window in the screen when you go to the custom white balance mode. And then you can use something like this. This is an Expo Disc. I've talked about this before in a couple of streams. Uh, or you could be using something like a uh, uh, Expo, not Expo Disc, that's this thing. You could be using something like an X-Rite color checker that has the white balance uh, parts on it as well. Put that gray card into the box, push the button, and then now your white balance is set. You're good to go. There's nothing that you really need to worry about there. Um, but also, we have the tools in most of the cameras now called Luminance Spot Meter. We have Waveform for video shooting. Uh, and there is still the histogram for those that are used to shooting with a histogram to get your images done. All of those things, no matter what you do with your camera, is still going to be able to function the way you'd expect them to function. So you're going to be able to get good images. You're going to be able to have the exposure look the way you want it to. So. Before I go any further, let's take a look and see if there are any questions because these are uh, these are interactive streams. If you guys have questions, drop them in the chat. I can see them here, and we're going to go over them. So, uh, let's see here. We got a uh, lovely weather you're having. Yep, like you said, uh, loving the location change. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely one of the nicer uh, locations. Uh, the only downside is there's not a lot of shade up here, so I have to constantly keep 
changing, putting the sunglasses on so I can actually read. Uh, let's see here. Um, Sacred City, is this shaved? Not sure what you mean by is this shaved. Uh, live broadcasting would entice me if uh, I could switch between at least two cameras with minimal equipment, if any. So that's kind of actually a, a good point. You know, d depending on what your your live broadcasting needs are, it, it's going to depend on, you know, kind of change what, what camera and equipment you're probably going to be using. If you're using something like this, the GH5 Mark II, and you want a live broadcast, it is a one camera angle. So, um, you know, I can't necessarily mix multiple things in. However, the GH5 Mark II does allow you to send the wireless live streamed content to an RTMP server. So if you are in a larger environment where you can take in multiple RTMP video feeds, you could do it that way. You could have multiple cameras all feeding remotely from different parts of the world, feeding into a server, and then a centralized location handling the switching. So it is something that you could do with this camera. Um, as a little bit of a difference to say maybe working with RTSP, um, which would be, you know, another style of it, which you could do with say, you know, a, um, a BGH1, since that has wired ethernet uh, functionality. So let's see, one of the other questions here. I meant your sensor shaved down to the IR spectrum thingy. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a different, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna get back to that one, um, Sacred. Uh, Ruckus, uh, this is a flawless green screen you have going on there. Yeah, right? Um, and for those that, that are interested in doing something like this with your camera, doing broadcasting, if you're looking at a GH5 Mark II, um, right now, you know, we talk about the tools and the tips that these cameras have, and I, it's just me out here. If you guys went over and looked at the Instagram story and saw, um, I shot a little some, uh, some BTS uh, stuff just to promote the stream today you'll see that it's literally just my GH5 Mark II with the XLR1 audio adapter, uh, Sennheiser AVX microphone system that I've used, I used on the previous live stream as well. Uh, and then my uh, Z Flip 3 up on the, uh, on a holder so that I can get my Wi-Fi or my cellular signal in this case. There's no one else here with me. So that obviously poses some challenges, you know, as far as exposure goes, as far as focus goes, things like that. With this camera, since we're broadcasting 1080p at 60 frames, I'm using the 8 megabit per second uh, broadcast. Um, I could do 16 with the 5G service that I have here, but I also have a laptop hooked up to monitor uh, some other parts, and it's just a little bit easier to make sure that I'm well within what my upload speeds are. Um, I'm able to, you know, flip the screen forward. It's a small little thing, and I know that a lot of people look at front-facing screens and they say, ah, oh, you know, it's for vloggers, and, you know, what, what good is that kind of thing? But this is kind of a really, really good example of why having a screen that you can actually see yourself with is an, a very, very valuable tool for this. But more importantly, because I'm sending this to YouTube, I'm shooting in the Leica 709 color profile. So I'm shooting in a color profile that is going to be very comfortably accepted in for YouTube and for something like Twitch or whatever platform you're gonna be sending this to. So I don't really have to worry too much about color grading in post. I don't have to worry too much about, you know, highlights and shadows being crushed or blown out way too much. Now, there's still gonna be some of that uh, in a shot like this, I know if I look at the YouTube playback on my phone, the highlights are a little more blown out than what I see on the screen here. And that's, that's just one of the things that you're going to have to kind of keep in mind if you're doing this a little bit. And you can always tweak and play around with the settings. But when you're using the GH5 Mark II with certain lenses, like basically a lot of the more modern lenses that we have. So I've got a 12 to 60, 2.8 to f4 on here. It's the Leica lens. Um, this lens has the stepless iris on it. So as you've seen a couple of times, a cloud will go over and then we'll go into some very much needed shade since I'm sitting here in direct sunlight. Because it, it's using the modern lenses with the modern camera and our modern focusing system and iteration that we're using in this, uh, it means that the iris is gonna be a stepless iris. So I can leave this camera in 200 ISO, which is what I'm shooting at, I have the camera set to 180 degree shutter angle and the aperture is allowed to fluctuate on its own and it's gonna be doing it stepless and it's gonna be doing it seamlessly. So 
unlike what we used to run into, you know, years ago, where if it goes really dark or a cloud goes over, you're gonna see like that kind of click step down of an aperture. You don't see that with these lenses. So the 10 to 25, the 25 to 50, the eight to 18, the 12 to 60 that I'm using here, they're all gonna facilitate that for you. So it really opens up some of the areas that you can broadcast in when it's just a one person show. Like in the last 30 seconds, we've jumped from F16 to F22 because I'm an idiot and I forgot my ND filters. So that means, you know, I'm a little, uh, a little tough on my depth of field. Uh, you know, for people that want to be doing ultra shallow depth of field, you could very easily throw an ND filter on this and be shooting much shallower so the background's blown out. But this is a beautiful background, so why not take advantage of it? All right, let's see uh, some more of the questions that we've got here as my phone wants to uh, uh, catch up here. Uh, where is this viewpoint? I want to go. Where in Austin? Uh, Pennybacker Bridge. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ulrich. I'm surprised anyone actually knew that, but this is one of the more famous uh, spots uh, just outside of downtown uh, Austin, which right over my shoulder here, down there is Austin, uh, the city skyline. Uh, it's a little bit to the west of the um, of downtown, but there's a cool overlook here. It's awesome for nighttime photography. If you look up any of the um, uh, photographers that are based down here in, in Texas, in Austin in particular, you'll see a ton of shots from here. Uh, the river's right running down below the, uh, the bridge, as you can see over my shoulder, and it is, it is a beautiful location to be hanging out with. So you've got some cool hiking trails, stuff like that. Um, but back to, you know, talking about with the camera, you know, when, when you start looking at wanting to expand what you're doing in photography or videography, um, I, I am more of a photographer than a videographer. I've become more of a videographer over the last year or so. Um, what that allows you to do is start to, you know, play around with the equipment that you have, try new things. So this S1R, was converted into that, as I said before, a full spectrum S1R. It was done, the conversion was done by Kalari Vision, uh, and they convert it so that it sees the entire spectrum of light that's coming in. So now all you have to do, like I said before, is just drop a filter in uh, the optical path so that you change which light is actually getting to the sensor. Right now I've got my, the 850 nanometer black and white infrared filter on here, which what I'm gonna do, since I don't have my switcher, I can't show you the view through the camera, right after this stream, I'm gonna put up some examples that I shot from up here with the S1R into our Instagram stories. So make sure to go take a look at the Lumix USA Instagram channel uh, and let us know what you think in the stories. Uh, reach out to us there. Um, but because I'm using the camera that way and I've got it all set up, it means that I can be changing the entire style of what I want to shoot. I'm not stuck with any individual, you know, look or feel for the content that I want to produce. Now, as a heads up, this is a, this is a conversion that you do completely on your own. This isn't a conversion that we do. We don't uh, warranty a product after you've done a conversion like this to it. This is my own personal S1R that I had converted, so that's why I can do it. But being able to utilize mirrorless cameras in ways that you may not have ever thought you've, you could have done before is one of the things that the Lumix cameras, I think, have a bit of an edge over. Because of all the tools we put in there, because of all the capabilities you have with it, if you pick up secondhand a camera, if you're upgrading a camera and you want to change up your, your B cam or your backup camera, there are so many things that you can do with the technology to set yourself apart from the rest of the industry. Uh, and I'm sure everybody, especially with the way the last year and a half have gone, you know, finding new things to spark some creativity in your style of shooting and the, the, the content that you produce for your clients, families, and friends is kind of one of those cool things to, to really kind of lean on. Uh, let's see if there are any other... Um, questions here. Um, Patrick says, any new info on wired IP coming to the GH5 Mark II? Is that still planned? Um, yeah, so as we talked about when we uh, released the GH5 Mark II, we will have a uh, firmware update coming by the end of the year. Uh, I don't have any information on it yet, uh, but what that will do is give you a stronger connection than having to do your wireless uh, streaming like I'm doing here. 
One of the uh, kind of tricky parts about doing wireless live streaming is that depending on the environment you're in and the wireless interference that you have, you could have an amazingly strong wireless signal on your mobile device, but because you're adding one more wireless uh, connection into that chain, you could run into some interference where you're not necessarily going to be able to take full advantage of that bandwidth. Uh, with the update that we have coming uh, down the line, it's going to make this a lot easier and a lot more reliable for those situations. So here, I wouldn't have to be wirelessly streaming from my Mark II into my phone and then my phone broadcasting the information out. I could just plug it in and then not have to worry about that wireless connection between the two. It makes it that much easier to actually go live with. Um, so yeah, they, that firmware update is still coming, uh, and we, sh we should have more information on that uh, relatively soon, I hope. But like I said, I don't really have a ton of information about it yet. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Sacred says, voiding the warranty is a pathway to many abilities considered to be unnatural. <laughs> yeah, funny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just as clarity, uh, we don't... Uh, th this is a personal conversion on this. This isn't something done by Panasonic. This isn't something done by, by our brand. Uh, it is something that you would do at your own risk and at your own uh, decision with the camera that you own. So, um, But yeah, just know that you wouldn't have a warranty support through Panasonic if you were to convert the camera. So typically wait until after the warranty is expired. Um, let's see here. Patrick says, wow, wired to mobile? I thought it uh, would just be to computers over USB. Uh, no, so our our um, uh, wired tethering is what's coming with it. So you're going to be able to actually connect in over USB and, and do some wired tethering that way. It's really just a way to strengthen that connection and that, that way that the camera functions for you. So let's see here. Uh, John says, do you think we'll ever see SDI in a Lumix S1H style body in the near future? I, truthfully, I, I, I don't know. Um, SDI has its own challenges. Um, you know, if you look at the box camera, the, the BGH1, that does have SDI. It's got a 3G SDI, so you're good for 1080, 60 frames at 422, 10-bit. Um, you'd have to go up to, I believe it's 12G SDI uh, for that. Uh, and truthfully, I don't know what the overall benefit would be for a mirrorless-style camera to have it in the current way that mirrorless cameras are designed. I think you'd have to see some drastic changes uh, for that kind of platform for it. Um, but also, you start to look at, I think, cameras being designed for different applications, right? We know that the BGH-1 is very, very similar to a GH-5S. The big difference is just form factor. Uh, BGH1, it's in a box style uh, platform, but that allows us to put Genlock, timecode, SDI into that camera. You still have full size HDMI, and it also allowed us to put Ethernet onto it because its purpose was changed. You know, you're not necessarily going to be hand holding a BGH1 on a daily basis, where a GH5S, you probably could be looking at something like that more. Um, the the built in viewfinder. So, as the current platform, I, I really don't know if you're going to see an SDI built into the S1 or S1H platform as it sits. Um, it'd be something cool, and if that's something that, that you guys want to see, make sure to be letting us know these things in the chat, in our uh, email. You know, just reach out and actually let us know that these are things that you're looking for. Um, having those conversations over on the Facebook groups is great because we do see them we don't see all of them though. So if you reach out to us through Instagram, through our Lumix Live at us.panasonic.com, if you participate in these uh, live streams and let us know in the chat, that's one of the easiest ways to get your requests over to us so we can actually see them. So, let's see here. Um, I have a new G95 and I want a wide angle lens. Uh, which is recommended, the Lumix 14 to 28 or the Leica 8 to 18? I know the Lumix is much less money than the Leica. So I think you mean the 7 to 14. Um, well, that's going to depend on, uh, you know, really what your out, what your goals are. Uh, and that question came from Jeffrey. So. I would suggest looking at, at your style of shooting. Do you like to use filters? Do you 
um, want to have the ability to do that stepless iris like I was talking about before, like the, the 12 to 60 is that I'm doing here if you're shooting video. Um, if any of those are a yes in, in your requirements, then 100% go for the 8 to 18. Uh, it's a much newer lens. It has filter threads on it. It's a 2.8 to f4, so yes, it's a variable aperture, but the benefit there being that we have the stepless aperture design on it. So that means that even if you're shooting in shutter priority and you've got it set at 2.8 indoors and then you walk outside, you could have it automatically shift the aperture um, to compensate for the exposure or have it shift ISO for exposure, whatever your, your method would be. Um, and it's, it's gonna do it fine. Even if you're zooming from 18, uh, or from eight out to 18, that change from 2.8 to f4 is not gonna be um, really noticeable because of the way the uh, aperture blades micro step. So it, that, that could be the reason on its own. Um, going for a seven to 14 though, the seven to 14 is kind of one of the older lenses in the Lumix lineup. It's been around since basically the launch of mirrorless uh, as a camera category. Uh, since we were the first ones to make a mirrorless camera. Uh, and it's, it's a great lens, um, but you lose the ability to put filters on it easily. You have to buy an external adapter that kind of compression fits around the front pedals. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, I think the best advice I can give you is just, you know, take a look at what your requirements are, write them down, see which one fits into there. If any of those things that I mentioned, filter, stepless iris, things like that, if any of those uh, matter to you, then go with the uh, 8 to 18. That would be my, my recommendation. Let's see here. Um, when is the GH6 coming out? Um, as soon as I know more information, I will let everybody know. Uh, at this point, I don't have any more information uh, as to when the GH6 is coming out. Trust me, I am as excited as everybody else is about this camera coming out uh, with the specs that we've released so far about it. Uh, was it a little over a month ago? Um, it, is, it is going to be an awesome camera and I think it's gonna be well worth the wait when it comes out. Um, so yeah, stay tuned, get subscribed, uh, follow us over on Instagram. That's where you're gonna find all this information first, uh, you know, as soon as we announce it. So let's see here. Um, can you use LUTs with live broadcasting? Thank you. Um, so I haven't checked. Um, I don't think you can use uh, LUTs while you're live broadcasting from Vlog. And truthfully for live broadcasting, I don't really think you'd want to. Um, because live broadcasting is gonna be in a very confined, it's guaranteed to be a 709 compression or a, a 709 color space. Shooting in V-Log is just adding an extra layer of complexity to your shot that just really isn't needed to do for this kind of shooting. Um, my best recommendation, just shoot like 709. Um, yeah, you're not gonna get this overly stylized look. You're not really gonna get a massively different kind of appeal to it, but it's going to fit properly within what your software is looking for. Um, and that's really what's going to, I think, make a bigger impact. You don't want to be broadcasting something into YouTube where you know that it's going to crush the shadows or clip the highlights uh, and, and really kind of cause a headache that way. Um, it's just a lot easier to shoot in 709 and make sure that that's how it's delivered. So let's see here. Uh, FC, hey, welcome, FC. Uh, what focal length with the 12 to 60 is used for the stream? I'm uh, shooting at 12 millimeter. So yeah, I'm shooting at 12 millimeter. So we're 24 millimeter wide angle in 35 field of view. So relatively wide angle. And since we're shooting 1080 60, it's using the full width of the sensor. So there's no additional crop. And because it's a GH5 Mark II and these cameras, there is no crop when you shoot even 4K 60. So it's a perfect setup there. Uh, let's see here, other questions we've got. Uh, Jeffrey, 7 to 14, Albert, 7 to 14 rocks. Uh, Jeffrey, or Sacred, 7 to 14, but uh, you can't use filter with it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, FC, ah, nice. I love the 12 millimeter. Yeah. Normally, uh, when we're back in the studio, I shoot at the, uh, with the 12 millimeter 1.4 Sumalux, uh, because I, I personally like the 24 millimeter, you know, field of view better than a lot of uh, different styles. 
um, or different focal lengths. So shooting something like this with the uh, the 12 to 60 at 12 just kind of makes a, a to me a really good look. Um, let's see what other questions do we have in here and remember these can be about anything that you guys want um we have a couple of the cool things that i've uh, i want to continue talking about on my s1r uh but let me just make sure i got everyone's questions answered so far yeah okay so um just as a reminder, we are streaming with the GH5 Mark II if you've just joined us. This is the Micro Four Thirds uh, GH5 platform, uh, but it's the Generation 2, so new, newer processor, updated sensor, uh, and the wireless streaming functionality. So I've got this hooked up to my Galaxy Z Flip 3 uh, using the wireless streaming so that I can actually broadcast from here out of my studio. So. Let's, uh, let's get back into talking about some of uh, this setup here. So, like I had mentioned before, with the different um, ways that this particular S1R is set up, I'm able to shoot all these different uh, styles of photography and videography. So, my infrared shot uh, with this particular filter on it, or if I want to go back to shooting, you know, real world or real life shots, so normal color, normal uh, just look of an image, that's where I put this filter on. So this is a uh, IR hot filter, uh, and what this one particular, uh, what this one does is it, it basically it blocks out all infrared lighting, just like the cover glass would be doing, or the, the IR cut filter on your sensor would be doing so that the camera goes back to shooting just like a regular standard S1R or S1 or whatever camera that you happen to may, you, you, you might convert. Uh, it makes it back to a regular camera. So you don't really lose all of that functionality if, as long as you pick up a filter that allows you to do it. And then on the flip side of it, I have this filter, which is actually a lot more of a, a custom filter. Again, this one is done by Kalari Vision. Uh, it's the company that converted the camera. Uh, and this filter in particular, this is their IR Chrome filter. This lets me shoot uh, infrared style photography that uh, was kind of one of the more uh, sought after infrared films back in the day. Uh, if you've ever looked and seen uh, some of those pictures where foliage looks kind of red or pinkish, you get the the really kind of blue looking sky and it just has a very different look to it. Uh, that's most likely what was called Aerochrome. And using this particular filter, this IR Chrome filter from Clarivision with a full spectrum camera, you can mimic that in the camera. Um, you do want to make sure you're taking white balance uh, Set, uh, shots before you actually take that particular picture. And like I said, one of the things about using something like this, this uh, particular Expo Disc, is that I can just clip this onto the front of the lens. I can then go into my settings here and actually pull up my custom white balance. I don't think you're going to be able to see it just because of the reflections, but I can put a box there, push the set button. Now my white balance has been set uh, for this particular shot. And then now when I actually go and take the image, so if I've got this at 16, if I take a shot, and I'll put that picture up over on our uh, Instagram page, uh, you'll see what that looks like in the actual um, 850 nanometer infrared on this particular one. But I'm gonna throw the IR Chrome filter on now and uh, change some stuff up there. So while I'm doing this, let's see what other questions we've got. All right, let's see here. FC says, are there any plans for multiple camera feeds to smartphones for live streaming? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if that's actually come up in any conversations, uh, but it is something that we can uh, bring up to our engineers and uh, uh, let them know, see if it's something that can be done. Uh, one of the things with broadcasting from a mobile device that you do have to be careful with is your upload speeds. Um, upload speeds, are very, very critical for broadcasting. Because this camera can shoot at uh, eight and up to 16 megabits per second, most mobile networks probably don't have 16 megabit per second upload unless you're on a 5G millimeter wave or 5G sub six. 
Um, because of where I am right now, I have really strong 5G signal. So I've got something like 40 meg up and I've got something like five or 600 meg down just on my mobile device. So in some cases, if you've been with me on Lumix Live for a while, you know that I've had some network connection issues at home. In some cases, I had better connection through my mobile device than I did at home. Um, so yeah, you wanna just kinda see what it is. Uh, if you're sending out multiple camera signals, all with eight megabit per second, so the quality stays the same, it means that you need to have that much more headroom for your upload and not every mobile carrier or device is gonna be able to support it. So, but it is something that we will bring over to our team. Let's see here. Uh, depth of shine, looking to upgrade G9 uh, to a G9 as, a, as good price and can you do live streaming with it? So the G9, um, you can do live streaming with it but not in the same way that we're doing live streaming right now. Um, it is a different way that you would actually be broadcasting from that camera. You would need an HDMI capture device or some sort of tool uh, to get yourself online. Um, the GH5 Mark II is the only one that does support the actual wireless live streaming, so broadcasting right into a mobile device or when we have that wired uh, USB uh, tethering or uh, streaming functionality. Um, you're still gonna be a little way out before um, you're able to do that kind of in a ubiquitous way with any camera. Uh, like I said, as of right now, the Mark II is the only one that can do it as its own self-contained tool. Um, but if you are looking at a G9, I would take a look at a GH5 Mark II also. They're very similar sensors. Uh, the GH5 Mark II has the um, uh, new AR coating on the sensor, which is gonna get you a little bit better image quality than the other uh, 20 megapixel sensors in the Lumix lineup. Uh, it has all the video functionality. It's unlimited recording. Uh, you have this wireless live broadcasting uh, functionality that I've got set up here. So you have a lot of different capabilities with it. It's different body design than the G9. So if the G9 is more of a comfortable camera for you, that could be more than enough reason to stick with the G9. Uh, but knowing that the GH5 Mark II is what just came out, it's the newest engine, it's, it's the newest revision of the sensor and the processor, all that stuff, I, this camera is going to give you the most longevity of um, the, the lineup to date. Um, I hate saying future-proof because no technology is future-proof. Um, it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, but this one probably is going to be the better uh, tool for you in, in the long run. Uh, if you know that video is going to be something that you, is going to be high on your list of priorities. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Barry says, question about different Lumix models. The FZ1000 Mark II, uh, is it a mirrorless camera or mirrored? Uh, well, that's, that would be a mirrorless camera. Um, technically, it's really going to depend on what you classify as a mirrorless camera. Um, the GH, the FZ cameras are mirrorless in the sense that they are, um, that they're, there is no mirror involved. It is literally a camera that has no mirror and is designed to just capture right off the sensor. So, you know, it's not really going to, sorry, I have to plug my, uh, the camera in here because uh, I'm running low on battery. Um, it's, it's not really going to be classified as a mirrorless camera per se. Um, at least I wouldn't classify it as a mirrorless camera in what we normally, you know, commonly call mirrorless. Uh, but it shares a lot uh, with typical mirrorless cameras. Um, hopefully that makes sense for you. Um, let's see here. Another question. Uh, Barry, and what is crop factor? So crop factor, uh, this is gonna be one of those things that I'm sure is going to uh, start all kinds of conversations in the chat, but crop factor at its basics is what is, has been assigned to the sensor size calculations based on full frame. 
So we look at a crop sensor camera. That could be APS-C, that could be APS-H, it could be micro four thirds, it could be one inch, you know, whatever you're looking at there. And the crop factor is what the size difference is of that sensor compared to a 35 millimeter full frame uh, sensor or image plane. Um, it expands further into things like, uh, you know, what is the, the field of view? What is the effective aperture? What is the effective depth of field? Um, that's where it starts to get really complicated. The truth is any lens that you have put on a camera. So if like with our, the GH5 Mark II for say here, this is a 2X crop factor. That means that your field of view is multiplied by two to get what you would need field of view wise equivalent in a 35 millimeter sensor. APS-C is 1.5 or 1.6. APS-H was, I believe, 1.3. Point and shoot cameras that go down into, you know, one inch sensors, you're looking at even greater than two. It could be like 2.3, 2.5, because it just, it's how many of those sensors you need to fill a 35 millimeter sensor. Uh, to get the same field of view. Where you see some confusion is how lenses are marked. So our all of our Micro Four Thirds lenses are marked with their actual focal lengths. So the 12 to 60 millimeter 2.8 to f4 is what I'm using right now. That is a 12 millimeter to 60 millimeter lens. When crop factor will only come into play when you are purposely trying to compare it to a 35 millimeter sensor or a different sized sensor. Uh, that's where you have to kind of do your math. Um, when we say 12 millimeter, because commonly we think 35 millimeter, that's why we say that it's a 24 millimeter field of view. Because if I had a full frame camera like my S1R here, if I set this to 24 millimeter, put it in the same exact spot where the sensor's in the same plane, I'm gonna see the same field of view. Um, that's the basics of crop factor. So, uh, let's see here. Rige, uh, is the GH5 Mark II a better stills camera than the G9? Um, I'd say in, in some respects, yes. In some aspects, no. Um, the no aspects would be, in my opinion, primarily down to ergonomics, how you like to work with the camera. Uh, the... G9 has a little bit high, or I think they have the same resolution viewfinder. I'm a little unprepared with that one, so I don't have that information right offhand. Um, the G9 just has a different form factor. If you're coming from an S-series camera and you want to get a Micro Four Thirds camera for your kit or you know a crop camera from us, um, the G9 is probably going to be the closest to what you're used to working with, ergonomic-wise. Um, from an image quality perspective, I think the GH5 Mark II is going to have a little bit of an edge over the G9, and that's primarily because it's the newer revision of the 20 megapixel sensor, it's the newer revision of the processor, which is fairly similar to what's in the G9, uh, but the hardware in general is, is a nice update. Uh, because we have that AR coating on the sensor, you're gonna get less reflection, you're gonna get less uh, ghosting, depending on the shooting environment that you're in. So if you shoot at night a lot and you have street lights and you know kind of pinpoints of light, the Mark II I think will actually deliver a little bit better image uh, than the G9. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's a night and day difference though. Um, so ultimately between those two cameras, I think it's really just gonna come down to you know, what your general need is gonna be between them. If you know you're gonna lean more towards video, go with the Mark II hands down. You're not gonna give up anything in still picture quality or any picture quality, uh, and you're gonna get all the extra benefits uh, that the GH can offer you. Like, I've, I've been sitting here, and right now we are at, um, let me look at what, what is the temperature? It is 90, 90 degrees right now. This camera is sitting in direct sunlight, and I've been broadcasting nonstop so far. Um, and it, there's no heat warnings, there's none of that stuff with our cameras. So you know that you're getting a tool that's just gonna work. The G9, if it had live streaming, I could probably do the same-ish thing, maybe not in direct sunlight like this because um, infrared heat is what will really stop cameras. So yes, cameras can be shot at really hot temperatures, uh, or at least ours can. 
uh, but it's sitting in direct sunlight, which is what you got to be careful about. So, let's see here. Um, Black Hills. Where is the ISO dual native crossover in the GH5S between which ISO settings? Uh, so the GH5S is going to be, I think it's 400 for the low range and 5,000 for the high range. Um, I will have to double check on that. Um, so the crossover is going, like if you have it in automatic, it's going to be at that the second ISO, at the high range. Um, that's why in certain situations, if you know that you have to shoot close to the higher uh, range circuit, and you're maybe one or two stops below that, switch to the high circuit, change uh, turn extended ISO on, and then pull down from that higher range. You'll get a cleaner looking image. You'll give up a little bit of dynamic range, but you get a cleaner looking image at the same ISOs. Uh, let's see here. Uh, depth of shine, can you shoot 21.9 with the GH5 Mark II, and is there a benefit over 16 by nine? Um, well, you don't shoot 21.9 natively um, in, in the camera. That would be an anamorphic de-squeeze. Um, or, yeah, roughly. So what you can do is you can set the crop markers up in the camera and that will mask it out for you so that you can capture enough information in that area on the screen and then when you bring it into your editing software and post, you would just crop out the top and bottom into that aspect ratio. You could totally do that. Or if you're shooting with anamorphic, uh, you'd be setting the camera to shoot in four by three aspect ratio, and that will let you, um, when you do your 2x D squeeze, that will bring it out to, I think it's what, two, three, nine to one, uh, if you're using a 2x uh, D squeeze. I could be totally wrong on that aspect ratio. But that's where shooting in those particular ratios would come in handy. Um, as far as benefits go, it's, just, it's a stylistic choice. If you're not shooting anamorphic, it's totally just stylistic. It's cropping things out just to get that letterbox look. Um, or if you know that you're displaying it on a 21 by nine monitor, then yeah, you'd be making sure that you're filling the whole monitor without stretching or crushing anything in. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of what your personal taste is with it. Uh, Redbit, hello. Hi, Redbit. Um, let's see here. Leroy, how do I set up the GH5 Mark II to do wireless live streaming? Uh, GH5 Mark II seems a bit warm to the touch under normal conditions. How warm is too warm? Well, um, too warm would be seeing a thermal indication on the uh, camera itself. If you see a thermal warning, that means that it's getting close uh, to needing to basically, you know, kind of cool off. Sorry, I got to wipe the sweat out of my eyes. Um, but like I said, I'm sitting out here in direct 90 degree weather, in direct sunlight, and my Mark II has been running for an hour and a half, and it's still going strong. So that's, that's not really an issue as long as you're in a GH series and higher, because um, they're really designed to run as a professional tool. Uh, for the second part of your or for the first part of your question, how to set it up? Um, we have a video over on the Lumix Academy's uh, playlist uh, that does walk through how to do a setup on uh, programming the GH5 Mark II to do wireless live streaming. Um, I am thinking about doing another one uh, that actually kind of shows you how I do it, um, but we're probably still a little bit of time away from me having time to actually do that. Uh, but ultimately, the most fast way to do it is use your mobile device connect Bluetooth first, uh, and with Bluetooth, then you're going to be able to actually get everything set up and uh, connect it through, plug in your RTMP link and all that stuff. So, let's see here. I'm gonna take one more question and then I'm gonna call it for today because uh, I am baking uh, in this sun. Um, Lumix, they're built like a tank. Oh, oh, okay, Barry wants to know what uh, the crop factor for the FZ-1000 Mark II is. Uh, I would have to take a look and see, actually, because I'm not 100% sure what that crop factor is off the top of my head. Um, I know it, it's over 2x. I think it might be like 2.3, 2.5, uh, because it's a one-inch sensor. But 
with that, um, I'm actually going to call today's stream uh, because it is really hot. I know that we're a little bit earlier than the normal one hour that we do um, by about 10 minutes. So I do apologize for everybody. Um, I didn't expect it to be as hot today. Um, but I want to remind everybody to uh, make sure that you give us uh, give this video a like. Uh, check out the rest of the playlist for the Lumix Live platform. Uh, these broadcasts that we do every week on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Sometimes we may have to change the time like we did last week, but we'll usually try to get everyone a good uh, you know heads up to that. Um, we will be going live next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time from uh, Cinegear. So uh, bear with us a little bit uh, during that particular stream next Thursday. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, make sure to go take a look at the uh, Lumix Pro services in your particular region. I don't have the graphics to put up, but you can always go back, take a look at one of our previous streams and see that information. Um, outside of that, if you have more questions or you have topics that you want us to cover in the future, send us an email to lumixlive at us.panasonic.com, uh, and I'm happy to take a look at those, see if we can get a stream out of some of the questions and comments that you all have. Uh, with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing everybody next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. With that, I'm out. It's hot. <laughs>